Hello Ratbags, it's Jade. Welcome to part two of my 50 survival games on console ranked. The very best, pretty much every single one that's been released, ranked in order of where I think they fit. If you haven't watched the first video, go and check it out, numbers 50 to 26. But today is the final countdown. Just like I did with the first video, I'm ranking them out of three categories, up to five points each out of a total of 15. The first category is survival. How many survival mechanics does the game have? Does it rely on survival to really make the game work. Then the second category is basically gameplay or story or fun. Are you enjoying the game that you're playing? And then the third category out of five is support. How well the game's been received. Are there any updates still pending? Has it had problems getting the game out? Does it run very differently compared to its PC counterpart or absolutely just not receiving the same kind of support? As always, it's one person's opinion based on these metrics and me covering every single survival game that's come to console in the last five years. So do leave a like, go and check out my YouTube memberships to get exclusive behind the scenes looks at content and let's go with 25 top survival games on consoles. Fallout 76 offers RPG world exploration with a huge choice in creatures, biomes and all sorts of base building, weapons, armors and components. It's got a lot going for it when you mention that in the same breath as survival, but it still manages to miss the spot ever so slightly. It is good for Care Bears, but they've nerfed the PvP to high heaven over the last couple years and despite its rocky launch, it has improved, I have to give it some credit. What I won't give it any credit for is still the fact it doesn't offer any kind of offline play or single player experience, still making you pay money on a monthly basis to have a semi server of your own to play with your friends, when as you've seen from this list so many other games offer that for free. Or at least when they offer servers they're proper servers and they don't shut down when you leave your server. And basically that's one of the reasons it's pretty ranked higher, yes it's improved, yes it's got a lot going for it but it really doesn't sit well with me what they've done and what they still continue to do with terms of support. Sure, they're updating the game, but they're still not removing the money grabbing practices. Absolutely content to wrangle every last dime out of the whales that carry on supporting this game. If you got it on the Xbox on Games Pass, then absolutely I'm sure you've enjoyed it, but for me, it's definitely not gonna make the top 20. I've probably been a little bit too kind to Last Oasis to include it above some of the games I've already shown off, but there is something about this game that I just really love. I've always loved the motion of these walkers. It's a game that you fight for water, for control of these oases, tile sets, hundreds of servers basically holding hundreds of players, and it's all about large clown warfare. They've messed around with it a little bit since it launched in Xbox, offering solo servers and beginner servers, but they compounded all of it back together for season four, and hopefully it's gonna do the trick. It's got a lot going for it, but it still is in a fluctuating state. Every season they get a new hype, a new bunch of players jump in, but then they do quickly leave. It needs definitely some more work and a little bit more leaning towards a little bit of PvE. But if you do like PvP, you like melee combat, you like thinking tactical, and as I said, large clan kind of warfare, then I think Last Oasis is definitely worth a punt. The quest for water, the quest for getting resources and at any point being attacked by other players is always going to keep you on edge, but it does offer some solutions that I wish other games would take notice of, like how to combat offline raiding with a great system where you can pack up your base on your walker and fly off to a safe zone. That doesn't mean you're always safe, there's plenty of ways to stop that happening, but it definitely offers half a solution towards the long time issues of always being offline raided. A survival game, not for the faint hearted, and definitely a bit of a labor of love. You might wanna wait another good four or five months and see how many updates it's had to see how much it's improved. But I definitely will keep my eyes on this one. I'm hoping I can put it a bit higher and I hope it just doesn't go any lower. There's lots of aspects that make up a survival game and a big part of it is the crafting and is the creative freedom in base building. Not every survival game has to have it, but if they do, they're generally considered a lot more playable. They've got that sandbox nature. And that's what Dragon Quest Builders 2 has, or maybe even the first one, once you get some pretty lengthy boring tutorials at the beginning. I'm not kidding, it's around 10 hours before you start enjoying a bit more freedom to go and explore and do what you want. They've got a unique setting in the story that you've got different worlds to explore that will give you different resources and you can then transport a lot of that resources or the ideas and blueprints back to your main island. Chuck in the whole defense mode that you have to defend your home or communities from mobs or creatures pretty regularly, as well as the food that you need to survive. And absolutely, Dragon Quest Builders is a survival game. 
a cozy one for sure and definitely geared towards maybe younger audience members. With Dragon Quest Builders 3 on the horizon, it will continue and let's see where that one falls next year. Not every game has to be dark, doom and gloom, sometimes you can have a bit of a nice colourful one and that's exactly what Astroneer is, surviving by getting enough oxygen every time you explore a planet, gathering resources to make the jump to the next one and hopefully that last jump home. It's filled with automation, filled with base building and all sorts of crazy technology. You've got buggies that you can ride around in, Jetpacks have recently added. This game has received a bunch of updates since its launch. Consoles have received them a little bit slower sometimes, but the developers have done their best to keep players in the loop, and Astroneer is definitely one of the best supported survival games out there in the last couple of years. It's now got proper multiplayer support. You can even go ahead and get your own server on it. A more chilled survival experience. Survival mechanics in a game called Survivalist are pretty big, as you would expect. You've got to manage your food, your water, and obviously go around a procedurally generated world, trying to build your bases up and defend them against mobs that will be incoming. It's a fun little compromise on the survival simulation genre. Sadly, the controls and UI do let this game down a little bit. It becomes a little bit tiresome having to manage certain things, and it definitely could do with maybe another revamp. But they are trying. This game's had a bunch of updates since it's come out it's got all sorts of things growing for it in terms of farming pets and the ability to train your monkeys to go and gather resources for you is big in the game once you understand that process that it's not strictly just a small survival game but it's more automation as well you'll get the most out of this with regular updates adding even more to a game that isn't early access i think this is a great shout for a survival fan it might seem a bit cheap and easy just to include pretty much any zombie game in a list of survival games. A lot of people associate zombies with survival and I can see why. A lot of these games are set in post-apocalyptic states and that's another thing that survival games are associated with. But beyond that, I think that Dying Light does offer that survival element where you've got the zombies chasing you, nighttime becomes a real terror to explore and it's got all the crafting options as well. While there's no explicit need for food and water to keep you alive, it still has enough of the elements for me to make it just about a full-blown survival game. It's going to be interesting to see how much of that is transferred over to the sequel that's due out later on this year. I would say on console it's had a bunch of support over the years and that elevates it as well beyond games like Days Gone where it really has gone the extra mile in making sure that their player base has got new content every few months, some new thing added, new game mode, new updates as well as paid DLC to keep ardent fans happy. So because I left it so long, a couple of other games did launch in the time that I finished off the first and second parts of this video. So I have cheated a little bit and I've put two games made by the same developer as a one slot. The Flame in the Flood and Drake Hollow, both made by the Molasses Game Company. Great games, both made years apart and you can really see the difference and changes with the development team. The Flame in the Dark is a much more roguelike game. It's hard as nails and it still has some issues with UI. But as you explore the rivers, you come across islands where you get more resources and hopefully build yourself up to last as long as you possibly can. It's shown its age a little bit now and then the follow up Drake Hollow was a great nice breezy adaptation of a tower defence game where you have to protect your little Drakelins from attack from these stranger thing creatures all the while exploring different procedure generated open worlds. It was somewhat limited when it launched in terms of combat and real depth but they've added to that over the last year adding a bunch of stuff keeping the game updated and the latest one adds XP and a whole lot more to really flesh the game out. Definitely something I want to get back into. Both games do suffer a little bit still from content drops maybe not having enough variety in terms of what you can do but equally they are both still fantastic survival games especially the flame in the flood it's a really difficult one for the really hardcore survival fans out there a very late entry into this video, Tribes in Midgard is a compelling survival RPG focused co-op game. You and up to 10 friends running around, gathering resources, building up armors and weapons and taking on these giant Jotun while you're all protecting your tree of life from healthing creatures that come and attack every single night. That's what makes up the bulk of the survival content. You don't necessarily need food or water to keep yourself alive, although obviously it does replenish your health. It's more about the base defenses and keeping that tree safe from harm. 
In fact, they've done a lot to help with the grind that you find in other survival games. One hit gets you that resource instead of grinding away needlessly, and it's fairly easy to get yourself some decent weapons. They've got a variety of different modes, and it is a live service game. They're promising content and updates for the next year to come, with it coming every sort of two months. I followed the progress of this game for over two years and I'm so pleased to see it actually be a success. We're coming up to a million players have now played it. It's a shame it's not on Xbox yet, but it does look like it's only a timed exclusive, so expect it to launch on the Xbox consoles in maybe a year's time. All I'm hoping for now in the future is variety of different ways to play. You kind of have to follow a set pattern or routine to succeed in lasting the amount of time to take on a raid boss or the endless survival mode. And I'm kind of hoping there's some variety that we can mix it up and try different things. But nevertheless, a really solid Viking survival game. Absolutely give it a shot if you've got the chance. Stay okay 2 and its predecessor, which got remastered for the Xbox One, is a fairly decent suggestion for a survival game. Some might argue it varies on the kind of simulation more because of the way that you have to take care of survivors in your communities and settlements. I think this offers a really good, unique take on the survival genre. While it had lots of criticism when it came out at launch, it's had a bunch of updates since then in continuously adding and refining the gameplay and really adds a new experience to the survival genre. I'm pretty excited by the third version of the game. It might be the one that really sucks me in as I haven't really spent as much time in this series as maybe some of the others. There is a lot of busy work and it does bog the gameplay down a little bit having to take care of them. But once you get into the stages where it's kind of self-reliant and self-running, State of Decay does get a little bit more enjoyable. And of course, we've got zombies that you can blow up. Open world, co-op action, absolutely give this a try if you want to have some fun adventures with friends. So many survival games are pretty janky, so many of them had problems with updates, launches and just all sorts of issues with the developers. And I don't think any game has had as many update issues as 7 Days to Die. Separating them issues and taking a cold look at what the game offers right now and whether or not it's a decent survival game is pretty tough, so I'll do my best to balance it in this little short bit. 7 Days to Die is a horde based defence game where you will need food, water, worry about temperature, weather effects and ailments as you survive, yes, every 7 days against mega hordes of zombies. You'll also encounter all sorts of other zombie creatures while looking for wildlife, exploring and looting houses, towns and the countryside. It started off as a voxel based style game before fleshing it out and making it much more sandboxy. You can build huge bases, contraptions, defences and overall it is definitely one of the best survival games when you list them features and when you get a chance to play it with no problems. The PC version has spent 8 years in early access and is nowhere near close to still being finished and it's had umpteenth updates while console have waited 4 years for a meaningful update. I've covered this saga every step of the way and the latest is that Xbox and PlayStation on current consoles will never receive any more updates for this game. The best you can hope for is to buy a new version of the game on the next series of consoles once the PC version is done. That's a fact, that's what the developers have iterated time and time again and despite them reselling a new version of the game at different various local websites and retailers even giving false info stating that it had features from an update that doesn't exist for console, they are still adamant that they're not going to be updating the current versions of the game. I put this up pretty high last year, I was trying to give them the benefit of the doubt, but no, I cannot put this in the top 10. You could argue it shouldn't be even in the top 30 based on what I've just said to you. Definitely in need of some sort of resolution that provides closure for a lot of fans that have stuck with it. It's got more players playing it on console than PC at times over the years and a huge passionate crowd of fans that still would love to see some sort of update even if it was just bug fixing. In its current state it's old, it looks tired, there are a number of issues with saving the world or even logging on and playing multiplayer but it's still relatively a decent survival game all with them problems still. The one thing I'm hoping for now is that Funpimps will do the right thing and when it comes out on the next gen consoles they'll offer some sort of discount or upgrade for everyone that owns it on the current gen. 7 Days to Die is a great survival game on PC. On console, it's still just a bit of a hot mess. Genuinely, when I thought about doing this list, I waited until Rust came to console because I honestly thought it might be able to dislodge some of the biggest and best survival games out there. It would make a dent and I'd be putting it in the top 5 for sure. What an absolute wrong -un I am. Rust on console is an absolute cluster truck. No content three months after launch and seemingly no more for at least another three or four weeks and that'll only be on test servers. 
only three updates really effectively fixing a bunch of stuff that you would have expected in the first two weeks. Still no sign of the community features that so many players want, even though it's still gonna cost them a lot more money, like community servers, like skin stores, it still runs like absolute arse on older gen consoles with only the PS5 and Xbox Series X and S consoles particularly showing some sort of promise that this game will actually become good. The devs have got big plans like so many before them. They're meant to be rolling out fresh content updates every two and a half months but nothing they've done or said promises any of that kind of stuff. They're already over a month and a half late with the first batch and like I said it's not looking likely we're going to get any proper decent content for another month at least. Official numbers are already dropping. It is absolutely my worst fears. It's Daisy all over again. That game also launched to an absolute shit show. Horrible UI, horrible controls, and really just wasn't very good. But over time, Daisy did improve, and it's at the point now where it's a lot more stable and it is getting content. I'll bet not that much. Can Rust mount a comeback? I really hope so. I envision this taking over as being my number one game on my channel. But I couldn't do it. I couldn't simply sit by and watch Double Eleven rinse this cash cow. Despite its issues and problems, there's still no game like it. That's why I'm so saddened and why I'm, frankly, still pissed off about it. I want this game to succeed so much. When they start making the test servers open for everyone rather than people that bought the most expensive editions, when I see the pricing for the servers and it's about the same as other survival games and the skin store isn't gonna be a complete overinflated cost, D11 have had three years to cherry pick the best of the Rust content, three years to get this console pull up to scratch, and it just is unbearably bad. If you do own next gen consoles, you'll be wondering about the complaints, but for sure, try it on an OG Xbox One and you'll talk about 20 FPS if you're lucky. So yeah, I grudgingly put it in my top 20. I'm just hoping it does improve. And who knows, maybe, maybe they could turn it around and appear somewhere in my top five. Fighting off sharks is always going to be pretty harrowing and obviously Stranded Deep takes that up a notch as you build your rafts, go around from island to island, procedure generated world, trying to get the components to make your escape. It's a fun game, it's got some really good decent survival mechanics to it. Although there are a few things that hold it back, there are some decisions about the survival stuff that I'm a bit baffled by. Base building isn't really necessary as much as you would think, you need don't really need it other than decorative purposes and it's still got a few issues with the UI and the controls. No spoilers but the ending also is a bit unsatisfactory. I find this game slightly boring on my own, but good news, they're adding multiplayer at last. It's in the last stages before hitting Xbox, PlayStation, and hopefully it'll come to the Switch version in a while too. Cheapest chips normally, definitely recommended if you want to play a new one with some pals. There's lots of bosses to fight, and yeah, as I said, they still haven't actually technically finished the game. It is on its last few stretches on PC in early access. One of the few space survival games that just about gets it right, Breath Edge, is a simulation survival game where you will be floating around in all sorts of crazy ways, trying to get enough technology, resources, and tools to get you through a big chunky story. There's survival mode, there's sandbox mode. It's got a lot going for it. This early access title was in years on PC. It came to consoles recently and I would say it's a fairly decent game. The survival elements are pretty heavy. You need oxygen, you need food, you need water. Dangers in terms of enemies don't really become apparent until a bit later on in the game, but it's definitely a bit of a slog getting there. A lot of questionable fart gags, that kind of stuff going on here, so there's a bit of humour and obviously, yeah, lots of survival focus. It's a pretty little game as well and it runs pretty decently on console, even on Nintendo Switch. It's also got more content coming by the looks of things, free chapters and extra game modes on its way too, so the future's good for this one. Daisy placed higher than Rust. What crack are you on, Jade? Well, don't forget, this is the console version of the rundown. I've got lots of problems with Daisy, especially over the years, the way the console updates have hit, and the game is just not really made or tailored especially well in terms of UI and controls. But there's no doubt about it, DayZ, over the last year and a half, has supported their game a lot better than some of their other rivals. PC updates have hit and have hit on consoles on day one. There isn't a huge gap in content, there isn't a huge amount of stuff that's missing other than maybe mod support. So Daisy experience on console has improved a lot. Whether or not that content is necessarily great is up to you. They haven't really hit it with the big updates that maybe a lot of us are expecting. 
There's a hell of a lot of content still left over from their standalone days, which so many DayZ fans kind of hold Bohemia to, with good reason, because it was kind of promised that a lot of that content would come. Instead, they drip fed new guns in the last year, they shortened their dev team, and pretty much didn't make it the focus, as they've done many times over over the years. But very recently, they added contaminated zones to the game, and I've got high hopes that, yes, maybe DayZ is worth visiting again. As an experience, it's absolutely one of the bigger survival based games. You've got to eat, you've got to drink, you've got to worry about infections, and of course, yes, zombies. So yes, it scores highly in the survival category. If it ever gets to the point where it redoes the UI or does the control scheme a bit better, or we do see significant big chunky updates hitting again and a lot better performance, I'll absolutely put this a bit higher in future. Conan Exiles Fall From Grace has been pretty mighty. I was voting this as one of the better survival games in last year's video, even beating Art Survival Evolved, simply because the developers had been on a roll ever since its release, adding fresh new content for free, and then adding all paid DLCs that gave you the option to add new building options, as well as armor and weapon skins alongside it. But the bulk of the content was free. New dungeons, new ways to play, new enemies, new missions, new quests. They went quiet for a while and then we heard the mumblings of Ida Sipta. In fact, I leaked it first about what was going to be going on and it took a long time to arrive on console. Eight months after the PC launch, at no point did Funcom really give any expectation that consoles wouldn't receive it. It was such a shock because they'd done so well in releasing content pretty much the same time for all their platforms. Turns out Ida Sipta wasn't the jewel in the crown that they maybe had hoped. Players have found it pretty repetitive and boring already and it hasn't captured the imagination as much as they'd think. It was probably a mistake to launch it in early access and take so long. Although they got feedback from fans and definitely improved it, I still think it just made the hype and excitement all that much worse. They also went like eight months without any proper updates for Xbox or PlayStation, leaving it in a pretty poor state blaming it on COVID, which is a fair, fair thing to say, but so many of their rivals, even smaller companies, had managed to update the game, keep on top of things. They've now corrected that by buying a QA company in Bulgaria, so it looks like going forward, it hopefully will be a lot better, but it does look like their focus is more and more shifting towards June, the next Funcom release. If you picked up Conan today though, what would it offer? Quests, a hardcore survival experience, lots of combat, trying to beat Dark Souls, Maybe not necessarily getting there, but it's definitely more advanced than any of the other survival games I could probably mention. If you love the grind, you love crafting, you've got it made in Conan. Hundreds of different ways that you have to grind up materials, refine them into others, and use a whole plethora of different benches to make the armors and weapons to succeed. And of course, you've got the thralls as well as pets and creatures that you can bend to your will. Let's hope they do carry on supporting it a little bit longer, as I do think June's still at least 18 months away, and hopefully Conan can rise to the top again. But for now, yeah, it's got a much worse position, because although they've got back on track a little bit with bug fixes, and they've finally added the ability to transfer your single player characters to other worlds, I still think Conan might be one of them ones that gets drip fed content barely clinging on until we get a big announcement about their next game. It also doesn't help that on console with every update you have to re-download the whole friggin thing and there's still a multitude of issues that players are still having. But if you can get past the bugs, get past the optimization, then you will have a fun experience doing all the missions, completing all the feats and getting your character to OP Conan Barbarian status. The game is also filled with a litany of nice building pieces to make all sorts of crazy, crazy creations. So it's definitely one of its strong points if you like building too. A good game brought to its knees by poor management with the COVID situation and now hopefully going to be rising to the top once more. When I first loaded up Art Survival Evolved and I got chumped on by my first Raptor, I thought, wow, this, this game is hard. As you progress in Ark, it becomes easier and easier. With each update and each DLC, the game gets even easier. So that by the end, on Genesis 2, the latest paid expansion, you start off the game with end game armor. That's pretty much the trajectory for Art Survival Evolved. A great concept, great idea, and still a fantastic survival game, even on console with all the problems and issues I'm about to list. With something like 10 maps to explore, you'll have thousands of hours pretty much playing a Pokemon dinosaur themed game. 
But once you get the hang of them early survival elements of food and water, the game doesn't get as hard as you would think it does. And you kind of learn the ropes quickly. You've got various different ways to get resources. It's still got some of the best base building in any game that I've played. I really love the creativity of that aspect. And the biomes and maps are gorgeous and some of the best looking normally. But the grind is real, just like it is in a lot of survival games. And when you start adding that up and realize that actually, it's survival, but it's not as big as survival as some of the others that I'm going to show you guys, you do start losing points. Then when you throw in the actual console performance, an arc really does start tumbling down. Arc made my channel in the beginning, but I've always been critical because the development team have just had some really shocking decisions over the years. They don't seem to have any sort of console Q&A each and every update, DLC, season pass that gets added is broken, buggy, and takes months and months to fix. It's an absolute meme how always late they are, how many delays they'll always talk about. The higher ups at Wildcard absolutely put hype above substance, really not caring how the game performs on consoles one iota. Even simple event updates that are meant to give us some free skins and some increased rates often break the game on console for weeks on end. Yes, they have supported the game with free maps each and every year pretty much, as well as paid expansions, and they have updated the game with quality of life revamps every now and then, but nowhere near as much as you would actually think. In the four years since launch, we've only actually had three TLC updates that revamp some of the dinosaurs and do a lot of much needed quality of life fixes or big system changes. Each and every DLC that comes out is paid to win. It always gives you an advantage on the official servers against other players that don't have it. And their treatment of the Nintendo Switch, releasing the console version of the game and then not doing a single update in three years. That's why I've put it so low in terms of support. Now, of course, that's my opinion about stuff. I've covered the game since almost its inception and it helped break my channel into what it is today. But I appreciate that a lot of other people simply don't care about a bunch of that stuff. What they just really love is being able to survive, grabbing their army of dinosaurs, breeding, getting mutations, building fantastic curations and taking on the many challenges that all the different maps offer. It's buggy, it's poor, it's missing a PS5 upgrade that they said would come and yet eight months later, nowhere in sight. And it looks likely that the next version, Arc 2, will be an Xbox and PC exclusive. But that's still not stopping the art phenomenon from existing. People absolutely love this game. I may not appreciate it as much as I once did, but I know for sure it's still one of the most solid survival game experiences on console. So remember I said that lots of these games will have the same amount of points, but it's all just about my personal preference, what I've been enjoying playing in the last year. And Grounded is definitely one of them games that's going to be more personal. It's got the same points as Ark, same points as Conan, but I still prefer playing this at the moment. And I think that's a big deal for a game that's still in early access and still got another year and a bit still probably of development. Grounded has you running around just like you were in the movie Honey, I Shrunk the Kids as you explore a huge backyard fighting off bugs, insects and trying to find all sorts of science points to get upgrades and unlocks to build bases, new armors, new weapons and explore the story and the missions that are in the game. They've just added their recent big boss and there's another new update on its way. They've also revamped building, adding a new tile set, which has really give a little bit more creativity to the game as well. I'm so looking forward to where this game's gonna go. One of the biggest months I've ever had on my channel, giving me the most amount of subs, the most amount of views in one single month. Grounded, I have a lot to thank for, but I still actually just love the game. It's got a gentleness to it, but it's still pretty hard at times. The game can be pretty tough. It's got all the typical survival mechanics you come to expect, with different game modes though, to make it a bit easier or harder, and of course, creative. The updates have changed though slightly, now they're every three months, but are hopefully offering more chunky content rather than every month only being small. Much like Conan, it can suddenly start getting a bit repetitive once you've explored fully the backyard, but with more biomes gonna be added in the next year, and I'm guessing even more creatures and new ways to play. I can't wait to see the future of Grounded, and that's why it's above some of the games that maybe a lot of you guys would be surprised by. I'm still pretty confident that when the game is finished, it will go even higher up the list. You may be thinking I'm pretty critical of some of these games in this list, but when you compare their development to one of the most maligned games in gaming history, No Man's Sky, then you kind of see where I'm coming from. 
The launch was filled with lies, none of the content that so many people were expecting, and it took a good little while for them to get right and back again. But they did come back again. With update after update over the last five years, free content that dwarfs so much more than they originally promised and makes good on all the issues they once had. It's still up in the air whether or not it's a great survival game. I know it's still an acquired taste, but for me, it's definitely worthy of a place in the top 10, above some of the bigger games that maybe you'd come to expect because of that very reason, the support it's received, the different varieties of ways that you can play, exploring, base building, or even brand new settlement of a space port. It's a big part of the reason that I rate it so highly, the versatility of this game, where you can mix it up and do what you want in terms of either exploring planets, finding out lore, completing missions, base building, or just simply flying through space. It's a testament that other games that I've criticised for not having enough updates, not doing enough, can turn it around if they really want to, and all of the No Man's Sky stuff has come for free, not a single microtransaction or paid DLC. You technically only need oxygen, and it's not particularly hard to get hold of, but I still rate it as one of the bigger and better survive games out there. Give it a shot if you haven't already tried it. Don't listen to all the hate and negativity around it. At least find out for yourself whether or not it's your cup of space joke. Terraria is about to receive its final console content update. 1.4 Journey's End offers new bosses, new ways to play, adding an easier mode, or almost a sandbox mode, and an even more difficult mode to play. Loads of additions, loads of great stuff that console fans have been waiting over a year for, ever since it was released on PC, and a year before that when it was first announced. Simply put, Terraria is in my top 3 of games all time. The reason it's not as high in this list is because the survival elements are kind of light. You don't technically need food and water to survive, nor any kind of oxygen, but you do have to defend your base. You get attacked periodically by groups of zombies and other mobs and creatures, and it's really challenging. All the crafting that you've got in the game, all the exploration, I really do think it still deserves a place in a survival list. It has lost a few points because of the slow nature of updates. This is like the third time that console players have had to wait more than a year for a single update. In fact, before this, it was two years for an update that kept it on parity with the PC versions. But judging it on what it's going to have in the next couple of weeks, it is the complete game, the complete picture. The only thing they're going to be adding hopefully in the future is crossplay and Switch will be following up hopefully in the near future too. I can't wait. Don't dismiss this as a kid's game, it's rock hard and one of the best ones out. The Don't Starve series blends that mix of roguelike and survival like no others and so many have tried to recreate. It is one of the first survival games I ever played, long before Art Survival evolved and it definitely holds a place because of that. Hard as nails, you can make it a bit easier in the settings, but it's a tough mix of running around, gathering resources, keeping your food, your water and your sanity levels high as you explore an increasingly difficult world. The sequel Don't Starve Together offered multiplayer components and they've got a bunch of DLC characters that have come out over the years that you can pay money for, as well as a bunch of free updates, including the latest where you have to survive under the boughs of a tree. Great game, definitely deservedly placed in top 10. With the way I've done the point system, games that obviously have a bit more difficulty in them and really do rely on all elements of survival, keeping yourself hydrated, food, making sure temperature is okay and not being attacked every two minutes by creatures is really going to mean you're going to get a higher score. That's why Green Hell has got one of the highest out of the list. As we get to the top five, of course, lots of these games are going to have high survival scores. Not just that though, but Green Hell's gameplay is pretty solid too. It's got a decent story in it that makes you want to explore further and if you're not down for that, you can endlessly survive in sandbox modes too. While I still think it's not as pretty looking as some of the other games, even on PC, it's still got a charm and a look about it and a feel that no other game really matches. With updates still to come as well, offering the same content that PC has, it's still looking good for Xbox and PlayStation, and it's available on Switch as well, again, a plus point for many. With the Spirits Amazonia content drop still to come, the future's looking good for Green Hell. I guess the only thing that really holds it back is the control system is still just a bit over convoluted and probably still not built as good as it could be for consoles. And it did take an awful long time for it to arrive on console, despite many, many release dates before it. But it's a solid survival game and absolutely deservedly in the top five. Pretty much like the rest of the games that I've put together, Subnautica and its sequel Below Zero are very, very close to each other in terms of what they offer. Survival in an underwater world, facing off against giant leviathans as you get technology to explore, uncover story and hopefully make your escape or find the answers to mysteries. 
The first Subnautica had a protracted development and eventually made its way to consoles. It's had performance issues and that's why it's not maybe rated as highly as it probably could be. But absolutely, the story, even in the first one where it's a little bit more ambiguous, is definitely worthy of your attention. Below Zero adds a lot more of that story content and some people say it's maybe not as good, but I quite like the focus. I don't necessarily need a survival game with hundreds of hours of content. Just give me a solid experience where I get my jump scares through these magnificent creatures that you find all the while trying to build up bases and find unique technology to travel through. It does fail somewhat in terms of offering more new playable items and that's probably Below Zero's only downfall. But as a whole both games offer an experience unlike many other survival games. If only they had added one of the most requested features from the first game which was multiplayer I think this would absolutely probably be in the top three survival games. It's not as hardcore as the, some of the other games in this list, but for sure it can be really challenging and really tough. But it's a beautiful game, I love the vibe, I've always loved the atmosphere. If I had to choose which was the better game out of the two, I would actually say Below Zero. I preferred the more focused look of it, and if I'd never played the first one, the jump scares and stuff would still be all unique to me, and I like the guided approach. As said, it does lose a few points because of the performance issues and some of them requests that just weren't met. It does look like it's the end of the road for a good long while. Their next game is going to be some sort of RTS game, so don't expect another Subnautica for a good few years. But absolutely, you must play or try this game or series if you've never tried it and love survival. It's pretty ridiculous that two years ago when I did this list, I didn't include Minecraft or Terraria. I decided that they were sandbox games, no longer really proper survival. And especially in the case of Minecraft, I did it dirty. Of course it's still a survival game. You do need food to stay alive. But over the years, a lot of focus had been on other aspects of the game, and it transformed into something completely, completely different in various different cases. But over the last couple of years, adding more biomes, adding more features to the game, it started to feel more and more like a survival game once again. So of course, it's deserved of a place in the top three. It's one of the godfathers of survival. It absolutely popularized survival again from being something that was just a bit obscure in the 80s and 90s to something absolutely amazing in the late 2000s, early 2010s. I shouldn't really need to explain any further what Minecraft is. What we can delve into is the support it's receiving consoles. Over the last few years, they've only had one major update per year and maybe a small quality of life fixes in between that time. They have opened up experimental servers on consoles now as well, particularly the Xbox where you can access some of this stuff like the snapshots and you get a chance to taste what's to come a little bit earlier. So in terms of support, of course it's got it. These big updates add a whole lot to the game usually, offering brand new biomes, new ways to explore and new items or creatures to face. I guess what really stops Minecraft from being number one is that level of survival. Once you get the basics of learning that you need some food, that's pretty much it, you're set. It's never hard to find food, you don't need water and there's not many other components. You do get the zombies come and attack you occasionally if you're in your base, but soon you realise you can put lights out everywhere, so that's why it only gets an average survival score. It'd receive even more points for support if it didn't charge so much for the packs that you can buy. Your kids are probably used to it by now with all the Fortnite and all the other MTX that we've all had to face over the last few years in the gaming industry. It's commonplace now, maybe not such a big deal, but it still rankles with me that Minecraft was such a free giving game and with all the mod support on PC, we kind of hoped that would maybe transfer to consoles one day. And it has, but of course, not without absolutely making a ton of money for Microsoft. They do at least pay some of the creators that put their creations on their stores, but again, maybe not as enough as maybe they should. A few minor negatives, but undoubtedly, this game has kickstarted a whole generation of survival. Every single game you've seen in this list has taken some sort of inspiration from Minecraft over the years, either implementing it heavily or just lightly. It's got its fingers deep into the history of survival, and it will continue to do so for the next 10 years at least. Bottom line, Minecraft is still just fun to play. You still lose hours. That's why they called it Minecraft, and that's why it's in my top three. Last year, I put The Long Dark as like number 10 in my list. When I re-examined survival genre on consoles and how they perform, the kind of updates they receive, and the gameplay itself, how good it is, 
And of course, the survival mechanics, how important it is to the enjoyment of the game. You have to put the long dark higher. It has had issues with its content, but not the survival parts, at least anyway. It's a sandbox game with a separate story mode that's been delivered in episodes. These episodes have taken far too long to get done, and it's probably the one thing that's been holding the long dark from greatness. Ever since it launched a good few years ago now, they've been releasing usually one episode a year, and it's still not finished. So some people would have never enjoyed the story of The Long Dark. It's always just been about the sandbox survival that was mostly been in the game since its inception in 2014. And that's where the strength of this game lies. It's one of the toughest survival games you will play. The pure mechanics of having to make sure you've got enough food, water and keeping yourself warm against the cold and of course from the dangers of the wildlife. No zombies in this game but plenty of reasons that you should be running. It takes dedication, preparation before you go and explore. Even the smallest of adventures can suddenly turn bad. Alongside their long-awaited episode updates, they have been frequently updating the sandbox, adding new items, changing and adjusting the way that you play this game, until honestly, it is deserved of them top five survival points. The gameplay is solid as well. I'll bet I still find the controls ever so slightly fiddly. That said, you'll never get any greater accomplishment than completing a run in the sandbox mode or adventuring and setting yourself some of the many challenges that the game also offers. If they can just get the final episodes done for this game, it might even end up being number one next time. Here we are, the final one. Yep, it's the forest again. I really nearly did put The Long Dark or Minecraft as number one, but in the end, when I really thought it about survival, what it means to survive in a game, you've got it all in the forest. You've got to make sure you've got food, you've got hydration, you've got to make sure that you've got protection in your base, and you will be encountering a whole variety of different types of biomes and creatures more importantly. And that's what really brings this game to life. It's the fight, the survival against the creatures. If you're not building your bases in the right way or constantly keeping things on the go, you are gonna get overwhelmed by the mutants of the forest. I really can't stand horror games. I'm not a big fan of jump scares. So it's surprising that it's still one of my favorite. That's because I can appreciate the story, the elements of where you explore. It isn't the world's biggest game. Like you can get through this in a number of hours once you get competent at it. And there are complaints that it doesn't have enough content. What do you people want? For the price of it is on Steam and a cheap price on PS4, it offered a compact survival story. It gave you incidental storytelling that made you compelled to go and look for more clues and hopefully find the final answer to what's been going on on this island and where your son is. They spent a stupidly long time in early access, but once it was out, they even offered a free update adding new mechanics as well as new dangers. If it was only available on other platforms like Xbox, and yes, maybe possibly did have a few more quality of life updates, it would get the perfect score. But even up against PC games, I'm still probably gonna vote this as the number one survival game of all time. Until the sequel comes out, that is. And hopefully it makes an appearance on an Xbox. And there we go, agree, disagree, Put your top three survival games in the comments down below. Heck, put your top five or top 10 if you really want to. Over the next few months, I am going to let you guys decide. I'm starting up a brand new series where you'll get to vote on my community page each and every week, and there'll be a video to go along with it. I'm gonna focus on survival stories. I'm gonna focus on the enemies and creatures in games. We're gonna focus on the multiplayer, the PVP, the base building. I want you guys to help me decide definitively out of each of these categories, what game does what best. Always, always just one person's opinion. You don't have to agree, you don't have to disagree, but do leave a like. Make sure you subscribe for the home of survival games. I'll see you at Bags for I guess next year's one too.